are only a few units away from finishing the course. And really these last three modules are what I personally consider to be my favorite part of the course. So hopefully you'll feel the same way. Um, and it's because we're going to be talking a lot more about the interesting part of meteorology. So up to this point, we've talked about things like microphysics, we've talked about stability, and a lot of theory. And the next few lectures, and really these last three modules, are going to talk more about the so what. And talk about many of the interesting weather phenomenon that you and I and everybody else have probably heard of, and, and yet don't really know a whole lot about. So let's dive in. Um, so this module and the next module are going to cover extreme weather. This module is going to cover thunderstorms and tornadoes. The next module is going to cover hurricanes. And I'm also going to throw on a few things about superstorms and other extreme weather events in the next module as well. All right, so with that said, uh, strap in and let's do this. So this first lecture is on just specific um, basic thunderstorms. And then the next lecture we'll talk about what are called severe thunderstorms. Those are a special type of thunderstorm. And then finally we'll talk about tornadoes. So before we get started with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what extreme weather is because as I mentioned, it's going to be what these next two modules are devoted to. So. Before we can do that, we need to remind ourselves what weather and climate are. So, weather is just the current state of the atmosphere at a given location. Um, and we've talked about this before, but just a quick review. Um, weather changes from moment to moment, from location to location. And it describes the condition of the atmosphere at a given location and a given time. Climate, on the other hand, is more the average weather. Instead of at a given time, it represents the average weather over time. So things such as average temperature, average rainfall, and so on, those are things that define a location's climate. Something else that also defines a location's climate is what kind of extreme weather events occur at a given location. So for example, here on the west coast of the United States, um, things such as drought and fire weather are much more common here than they would be in, say, New Orleans, Louisiana, where hurricanes are more common. Or let's say Chicago, Illinois, where blizzards are more common. and um, New York City, where blizzards and nor'easters are more common. So, different extreme weather events at different locations. Now, with that said, what is extreme weather? Well, we can define extreme weather as one of a few things. We can either define it as an extremely high or low weather condition. So, that could be something like a temperature of 120 degrees outside. For us here in the Bay Area, that's extreme. Or let's say it was 15 degrees outside. That's also extreme weather for us. Um, an event that's an extreme of climatological history, so it kind of goes outside of the norm. Like let's say um, in the middle of July, we got four inches of rain. That would be extreme. Not so much in the winter time, but definitely in the summertime. Um, but the definition I'm really going to use for the next two modules is extreme weather events are one, rare weather events, and two, that cause some kind of damage or some kind of major inclement state. And these events are short term. So that's all I'm going to say about that. These events are short term. They, they're here today, gone five minutes from now kind of thing. So as I mentioned, the first extreme weather event we're going to talk about are thunderstorms. Now, not all thunderstorms are actually extreme. And as a matter of fact, 
Thunderstorms are very common in much of the United States. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. But first off, what is a thunderstorm? Well, a thunderstorm is simply a storm that has rain falling out of it that contains lightning and thunder. That's a thunderstorm. Now, most thunderstorms are convective in that they form from two very key ingredients, heat and moisture. Make sure you write that down, write that down in red ink, double underline it. Guaranteed you'll see that on a quiz or on something in this class. Thunderstorms form from heat and moisture. Those two things allow air to rise, and as it rises, it expands, cools, and condenses, forming clouds. And if that air is allowed to continue to rise, the clouds get taller and taller and eventually they can form cumulus clouds or even more likely cumulonimbus clouds and those are what give us thunderstorms. Now, how does this relate to stability? Remember all that parcel of air rising and sinking stuff we talked about several modules back? Well, how does all of this relate to that? Well, the, the quick answer to that is that in an unstable atmosphere, air is able to rise, producing thunderstorms. However, if the atmosphere was stable, air couldn't rise and you wouldn't get thunderstorms. So the fact of the matter is, is that the stability of the atmosphere can actually make a difference, can be the difference between a nice sunny day and a severe thunderstorm outbreak. That's one of the reasons why we care so much about stability. Now, what actually triggers thunderstorms? Well, there's a few different things that can actually set them off. The first thing is just normal daytime heating. Daytime heating heats the surface of the earth up unevenly. The areas that are warmer are able to produce air that rises and that creates convection, and that gives us thunderstorms. However, there are other ways that thunderstorms can be triggered, such as air being forced up and over a mountain. Near Colorado, the most intense thunderstorms are usually present right near the Rocky Mountains, where warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico is pushed up the Rocky Mountains. Another way that thunderstorms can form is via low pressure. That's formed by divergence aloft, which produces convergence at the surface. And then finally, thunderstorms are also very common and, and can form very easily ahead of fronts, specifically cold fronts. Now, with this said, these four should sound pretty familiar to you. Um, we talked one time about how air can rise from the surface, creating clouds and, and, and rainfall. And really, those processes are the same processes that can trigger thunderstorms. And again, if the atmosphere is really unstable, any one of these can quickly take a nice sunny day and turn it into a severe thunderstorm outbreak. Now. As I mentioned previously, thunderstorms really aren't extreme in themselves. And as a matter of fact, they're very common across most of the United States. However, here in Northern California and in much of coastal California, thunderstorms just aren't common. We don't experience them here. And that's why for us, thunderstorms are a big deal because we just don't experience them. They're just not normal for us. And the reason why they're not normal for us is that we don't have enough heat and moisture to produce thunderstorms. Our ocean is too cold. Right off the coastline, it's just too cold. That gives us a lot of cold air. Therefore, we're usually lacking the heat and moisture needed to get thunderstorms. But every so often, every so often, the right setup falls into place and boom, we can get thunderstorms. Now, with that said, um, here in Northern California, we make a big deal out of them. 
because they're so rare. However, in much of the United States, they're just a part of normal everyday life. They're no big deal. They're, they're nothing that would make a headline on the news. They're nothing that would really affect anything. But here in California, because we're not used to them, we make a pretty big deal when they happen. Now, not only are they normal for much of the United States, they're actually essential for much of the United States. Because during the summertime, the storm track, which is formed by the jet stream, moves further north. As warm air from the tropics advances northward during the summertime, that entire storm track also moves north. And so the United States doesn't get a lot of storm systems in the summertime. However, there's a lot of heat and moisture, hence a lot of thunderstorms. And therefore, these thunderstorms actually provide us with a lot of our summer rainfall in the United States. Like I said, not so much here in California, but, um, oh well. But much of the United States, they actually provide much of the needed rainfall. Now, there are two types of thunderstorms, ordinary thunderstorms and severe thunderstorms. Um, we're going to talk primarily about ordinary thunderstorms in this lecture, and then we're going to talk about severe thunderstorms in the next lecture. And once we do that, we'll really be able to uncover the difference. Now, just like a human, thunderstorms actually have a life cycle. They actually evolve over time. And typical ordinary thunderstorms have three stages of development. Cumulus stage, which is the birth of the thunderstorm. Mature stage, which is the middle age of the thunderstorm. And dissipating stage, which is the death of the thunderstorm. Now, the cumulus stage starts with, as I've already mentioned, warm, moist air. And this warm, moist air is allowed to rise. As it rises, it cools and condenses. Now, as it condenses, recall when we talked about what was called latent heat, condensation actually warms the atmosphere up. This makes it easier for this air to continue to rise. That's why we care so much about latent heat. When latent heat is being released, this air is allowed to continue to rise. As it continues to rise, the cloud that it's forming becomes taller and taller, eventually becoming what we call a cumulus congestus cloud. Now with that said, these clouds can only go so high into the atmosphere. Once you get to the tropopause, which is the top of the troposphere, the cloud can't really travel any higher. However, there still is air being pushed upward. As that air is being pushed upward, it actually begins to fan outward. And I'll draw this here. As air in this cumulonimbus cloud reaches the top of the troposphere, it spreads outward like so. It spreads outward. And what that actually creates is it actually creates something called a cumulonimbus cloud. And this is where most thunderstorms really come from. I'll show you an image of a cumulonimbus cloud on the next slide. Now, at this stage, in the cumulus stage, you have a lot of warm rising air. We call that warm rising air an updraft. That's going to become important in a moment. Now, as this air is rising up, as it's rising up, it's pushing cooler air out of the way and forcing that cool air to sink to take its place. That sinking cool air is what's called a downdraft. So this is just like convection when we talked about heat transfers. This is just like that. Well, once that downdraft begins to form, the storm has transitioned from the cumulus stage into the mature stage. And as I mentioned earlier, 
as air rises, hits the top of the trophosphere, and then fans outward, forming what almost looks like an anvil. So if you've ever watched Looney Tunes, or if you've ever seen an anvil before, the top of a cumulonimbus cloud really looks like an anvil. Now, as this is happening, the, the droplets inside this cloud are getting larger and larger and larger. And eventually they get so large that they can't float anymore. Their drag is no longer great enough and they begin to fall. As well as, as I just mentioned a moment ago, that cool air from aloft also begins to sink downwards, creating a downdraft. Now, something else happens in this stage as well. You have a lot of particles, a lot of water particles that are floating around this cloud. And each of these water particles actually has a slightly polaric charge, a slightly different charge from end to end. What this actually can do is this can create a difference in charge from the base of the cloud down here at the bottom to the top of the cloud here at the top. That creates lightning. And we'll talk more about lightning in a few minutes. And then as I just mentioned, that cooler air from aloft, from the upper part of the atmosphere, entrains downward, creating a downdraft. Once you have this downdraft in place, the thunderstorm is at its strongest. And this marks the beginning of the mature stage. At this point, you have warm air rising, in the updraft and cold air sinking in the downdraft. Now what actually happens is as this cold air sinks it eventually hits the surface of the earth and as it hits the surface of the earth it fans outward. And as it fans outward it cuts off the updraft. Now the updraft is the source of food for these thunderstorms. So when you cut off the source of food Think about what would happen to anything if you cut off its source of food. It would eventually die. Well, the same thing happens here with thunderstorms. The thunderstorm eventually dies and enters what's called the dissipating stage. At this point, the cool air has cut off the warm moist air, the food is gone, and the thunderstorm begins to fall apart. As it happens, the thunderstorm simply just rains itself out. The process from birth to death typically only takes a few hours. Now, this dissipating stage is really crucial because this is how thunderstorms die. However, in the next lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about severe thunderstorms and severe thunderstorms actually have something that prevent them from transitioning into the dissipating stage. We'll talk about what, what it is in the next lecture. So this is the thunderstorm life cycle. You have warm rising air in the cumulus stage. Once that warm rising air reaches the top of the trophosphere, it spreads outward, forming an anvil-like shape. At the same time, cool air is descending into the thunderstorm and this allows rain to fall and this is what marks the beginning of the mature stage. Eventually this cool air cuts off the warm air and the thunderstorm begins to fall apart. And again this whole process takes just a few hours. Now where are thunderstorms most common here in America? Well as I mentioned earlier, it's simply too cold here. It's simply too cold here on the West Coast for thunderstorms to really form. However, along most of the East Coast, the waters here in the Gulf of Mexico are very hot and, forgive my terrible penmanship, as well as the waters here 
off the eastern seaboard. These are also very hot. These are also very hot. And therefore there's a lot of evaporation and there's a lot of heat. Well, this evaporation and heat produces a lot of warm, moist air, which then travels into the Deep South, also up into the Midwest, along the Great Plains, and right along the Colorado Front Range. And so thunderstorms in these areas become a lot more common. You've got that lifting mechanism, you've got enough heat, you've got enough moisture, everything is there. And Florida is especially prone to thunderstorms because of sea breeze thunderstorms. If you don't remember what those were, go back to module, if I recall, module six, and go back and look at mesoscale circulations. And you'll learn again about sea breeze thunderstorms. Um, and then I mentioned earlier about Colorado, there was this little blip of higher thunderstorm occurrences over Colorado. And this is actually right, along, right, right along, sorry, what's called the Front Range of Colorado. Right here is the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. I'll just denote them with RM for Rocky Mountains. And as air hits the sides of these Rocky Mountains, and by the way, the tallest part of the Rocky Mountains is in Colorado, as air hits these Rocky Mountains, that air has nowhere to go but up, and therefore thunderstorms become a lot more common right on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Now, what are some of the hazards that thunderstorms can produce? Well, there's six main hazards, and this is one of the reasons why thunderstorms are so concerning. The six main hazards are lightning, hail, straight line winds, microbursts, flooding rains, and tornadoes. We'll talk about these first five right now. We're gonna to save tornadoes for a couple of lectures. Okay, so lightning is statistically the deadliest phenomenon, not just from thunderstorms, but actually in America, even more than hurricanes and tornadoes combined. And I think one of the reasons why is because thunderstorms are much more common than hurricanes and tornadoes. But the reason why lightning forms is because you have an uneven distribution of charged particles, usually positively charged particles in the ice chips at the top of the thunderstorm, negative particles at the base of the cloud. This isn't always true. You can have a little bit of variation from this, but this is just the typical setup. And then positive charges at the surface complete the current and that's what produces lightning. So lightning works kind of like this. You have positive charges at the top of the cloud, up here, negative charges at the base of the cloud, and then positive charges on the surface of the Earth. Now, opposites attract. And so what actually happens is these negative charges actually begin to reach down to the base of the cloud, or sorry, from the base of the cloud to the surface. Now, at the same time, you have positive charges that are moving upward, and they look for anything they can to travel upward. So the chimney of a house, the antenna on your car, a lightning rod, trees, you, Many things can be used for these positive charges to climb up, reaching out to the negative charges, reaching out to the negative charges at the base of the cloud. As soon as the two meet, the positive and the negative charges, boom, lightning happens. So this is that process again. You have negative charges at the base of the cloud over here, reaching down, positive charges on the surface reaching up, and once they hit each other, boom, you get lightning. Now, 
lightning can produce some pretty awesome effects and, and some pretty awesome pictures. Here's one image. Here's another. I have no idea what that gentleman or, or lady or whoever that is is doing, but I'd be pretty amazed looking at that. Now, as I just mentioned a moment ago, lightning happens when positive charges reach out to the base of a cloud and negative charges are reaching out down towards the surface. Those positive charges use anything they can to reach up to the base of the cloud, including the hair on your body. And so one common sign that a lightning strike is about to occur is the hair on your body beginning to stand up. And this is an example of an individual who was at the Grand Canyon. They saw their hair standing up. They thought, hey, this would be a great time to take a hashtag selfie. And unfortunately, what they didn't understand was at this moment, they were in extreme danger. Luckily, a park ranger was nearby. The park ranger came, pushed them on the ground. They probably thought the person was a jerk, but it saved their life. The lightning strike then happened a few moments later. Somewhere else, they were spared from it. Now, what about hail? I'm sure we've all experienced hail at least at some point in our life. Hail is different from sleet in that sleet forms from rain that freezes as it reaches the ground. On the other hand, hail actually forms from rain that freezes as it rises up to the top of a cloud and then it falls fast enough to where it can't unfreeze, it can't melt before it hits the surface. This happens when the updrafts in a thunderstorm are so strong that rain droplets can't fall to the ground. Because they can't fall to the ground, they end up getting picked up by this updraft and hurled all the way to the, to the top of the cloud. Once they reach the top of the cloud, they freeze. Then they travel back down to the base of the cloud. If the updraft is strong enough, it'll catch those frozen droplets and hurl them back up in the cloud. The longer it spins in the cloud, the longer this, this raindrop spins in the cloud, the more water it collects. The more water it collects, the bigger it becomes. And so hailstones actually become larger and larger the more laps through this convective cycle they go through. So they start here at the base of the cloud, they get hurled up, they freeze into hailstones, then they fall back down, they get picked back up by the updraft, and sent back up. Every time they go up, they gather another layer, becoming larger and larger and larger. Eventually what can happen is they can get too big and updraft be damned, they just fall to the ground. Now how big can hail actually get? Well, here are some images showing you how big hail can get. Hail can get as big as dime size, penny size, nickel size, quarter size, golf ball size. Imagine getting in the, hit in the head by that. Here's the thing though. Hail actually gets even bigger. There have actually been reported hailstone sizes close to grapefruit and softball size hail. So getting hit in the head with a golf ball sized hailstone would hurt. Getting hit in the head with a hailstone like this would be severely damaging. Now where is hail most common? Well, hail is actually most common here in eastern Colorado, southwestern Wyoming, a bit, sorry, southeastern Wyoming, so eastern Colorado, southeastern Wyoming, my mistake, and western Nebraska, as well as all these areas right around here. So this also includes um, western Kansas, let's see here, so western Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, these whole areas here are where hail is most common. And we'll talk more about why this is 
in the next lecture. Now, other hazards can include thunder or damaging winds caused by thunderstorms. And this happens because as that warm air is rising up, if it's rising up really fast, it also forces air to fall down really fast. This air falling down really fast can actually fall at speeds higher than 100 miles per hour, creating what are called downbursts. Now, these downbursts, once they reach the surface of the Earth, they have nowhere to go but outwards. They spread out, creating extremely heavy winds. Now, these downbursts, if they're localized in a very small area, they are what are called microbursts. And microbursts are extremely intense, capable of blowing down trees and even crashing airplanes. Um, and, and there are a few examples of this. Um, one good example of this was a Delta Flight 191 in Dallas. It was on final approach and it hit a microburst. As it hit the microburst, this sudden downward flow of air pushed it right to the ground. So um, now if you're flying tonight or if you're getting on a plane sometime soon, don't worry. That accident actually made us a lot more aware of microbursts and now pilots actually know how to fly in them and most importantly how to avoid them. Now these downdrafts also as they hit the ground and they spread out they create what are called gust fronts and these gust fronts represent an area where the wind goes from being really calm outside of the downdraft to really really intense inside the updraft. And these downdrafts also bring cooler air with them and they can provide momentary cooling and lots of relief. Um, if you've ever experienced a thunderstorm on the East Coast, temperatures after the thunderstorm can drop by as much as 10 to 15 degrees. And if it was 90 degrees outside, it can produce a nice relief. So, this is how those downdrafts work. You have that warm rising air creating the thunderstorm. It pushes that cold air down, and as the cold air falls, it eventually reaches the surface of the Earth and has nowhere to go but out. The outer edge of the cool air is what's called the gust front. And as I mentioned, Airliners have, get, have been caught up in this before, and this particular airline, or this particular flight as I talked about, Delta Flight 191, was in particular a pretty big victim of this. The last thing I'll talk about in this lecture is flash flooding. Thunderstorms involve a lot of warm, moist, rising air. Therefore, there's a lot of moisture. Well, what goes up must come down. And therefore, in thunderstorms, there's a lot of heavy rain. Now, if a thunderstorm stays parked over an area, meaning that it just stays there, doesn't move away, and it just rains out, it can drop as much as three, four, five inches of rain in a very short period of time. And that kind of intense rainfall over a short period of time can create substantial flooding. And these are just a few examples of this. Um, the 1993 Upper Midwest floods, there was a big flood event in much of the Upper Midwest. Um, areas along the Mississippi River Valley were greatly affected by this. Um, a much more um, localized version of one of these events happened in an area just west of Boulder in Colorado called the Big Thompson Canyon Flood. And, and what basically happened here was a thunderstorm formed over the area and it stayed put. And it just dumped rain continuously, continuously, continuously. And this caused a lot of rain to swell up in the creeks around the area. And it could have actually killed a lot more people than it did. It, it killed some campers that were caught in the flooding but there's even been concerns that 
if this had happened closer to the city of Boulder, which is right on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, it could have been much more disastrous. Now, for just to wrap up today's lecture, um, typical thunderstorms have three stages to their life cycles, cumulus, mature, and dissipating. And some of the hazards created by thunderstorms include extreme winds, lightning, hail, and heavy rain. And these are just ordinary thunderstorms. In the next lecture, I'm going to be talking a lot more about what are called severe thunderstorms. Until then, I'm Terrence Mullins. Thank you for watching.